Hi, right. I'm going to be talking about promises and generators. Um, so a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is very new, so it's very experimental. It's getting into the latest browsers, but you're going to have to enable some flags. So if you're in Firefox Nightly, I believe this has just been added. Uh, it's in Chrome with a flag. If you go to the flags, and you can use it in Node with the dash dash harmony generators flag. Um, and my, the slides are available for this, so if you want to follow along or whatever, you can get, grab those now. So I'm going to start off not really talking about promises, not really talking about asynchronous stuff at all, but talking about how you represent a sequence. So if you've got a sequence of numbers, so here we're talking about the integers. This function returns the first n integers as an array. And that's really nice for representing finite sequences. Arrays work great for that. But the integers aren't really a finite sequence. Really, they're an infinite sequence. But we can't have this function return an, in an infinite sequence as an array. If we try and do that, just replace the condition there with true. This is trying to create an infinitely long array. So this count function is just never going to return. We're never going to get into that for loop, and we're never going to log any output. I should just note the for of there is a new construct, but it just loops over the items in an array or in a sequence, or it, it supports a much wider range of collections than, say, using a, for, a, a traditional for loop. So the next version of JavaScript has built-in support for these infinite collections. And they, it works using a, by making the function lazy and only, only executing as far as it needs to to return the values that are actually used. So what happens with this count function is that the function is executed only when we request the value. So initially, when you call count, none of the code inside the body is executed. Then the for loop requests the first value from count. And at that point, it executes as far as that first yield keyword. And when it gets to that first yield keyword, it returns that value, and we get to use it in the for loop. But it pauses the function. So it saves the entire execution state of that function. And then when we ask for the second value, it resumes that function from where the yield keyword was and continues around the loop a second time. So this is really useful for infinite sequences. Like this function represents all of the integers. And we can still get back to the semantics we had before. We can just write a simple take function that takes any infinite sequence and takes the first n items out of that sequence. And this would work for integers, but you could equally pass the Fibonacci sequence as an infinite sequence. And because, it's, because of the lazy nature of it, we could pull off the first five items, the first 10 items as needed. And we can reuse this. And we could have more complicated conditions as well. It doesn't have to be the first n items. It could be all the items up until an item that matches some condition, for example. So that's really powerful for maths and sequences and things. And later, I'm going to show you how it can be really useful for asynchronous programming as well. So to get back to the original point of asynchronous programming, I'm going to follow through a simple example. Say we want to write a function that reads a file and parses it as JSON and returns the result. It's a fairly simple thing, and it's a task that I'm sure many of you have had to do at some point, especially if you're writing server-side code. But if you write, write client-side code, you can think of this as just making a web request and then parsing that as JSON. Nothing I'm talking about is really specific to Node. The, so this function is really about as simple as it can, can be to accomplish this functionality. It takes a file name. It reads that file with UTF-8 encoding, so it gets a string back. And then it parses it as JSON and returns the result. If at any point one of these methods throws an error, if the read file operation throws an error, or the json.parse operation throws an error, then it's going to bubble up the stack. And we can handle that at some top level where we know more information about how we should handle it. So all of the errors propagate nicely. The results return nicely. And it's a really simple function to read. So we we can make that asynchronous. If we don't make it asynchronous, it's going to block the program, and nothing else is going to happen. If it's a client-side app and you do synchronous I.O., then you're going to be freezing the application. Nothing's going to happen for a while. If you're doing a server and you do synchronous I.O., then you're not going to be handling any other requests for a while. 
So you, you're going to effectively, the, the server will appear to be down to everyone else. So we can make this asynchronous just by taking a callback. So we add a second argument to the readJSON function that's callback. And we then also pass a function to our fs.read file. We then say if there's an error, we call back with the error. And if there's not, then we call back with null as our error argument and the result as the second argument. This isn't a lot more complicated than, than uh, the first function we wrote. But I want to, to show you today that this isn't sufficient. This code is a long way off a complete implementation of readJSON. And we can do better. So this is conflating the input with the output. It's kind of a subtle point, and it might not seem like it's important, but it turns out to have lots of effects down the line. So we're going from our really simple model of having arguments as inputs to functions and some return value as the result to now having this additional argument that represents how to, how to send the result back. That callback isn't really an input to the function. It's just part of the mechanics. It relies on pure convention that we, that we pass the error as the first, as the first argument and, we, and the result as the second argument, and that we don't do weird things like call the callback multiple times. So that can be a real problem later down the line. It also won't work with control flow primitives. It's really difficult to do an asynchronous operation in the middle of a for loop using this kind of technique. It's just not going to work. You're gonna, you, you, you can't pause the for loop while executing this asynchronous function. This currently doesn't handle errors. So this has a major flaw. If I try and read a JSON file that turns out not to be valid JSON, that, that exists so the file system read succeeds, or the web request if we were on the client. But where the JSON parse bit fails and throws an error, that error can't be caught anywhere. It's going to be thrown into the global scope because we're not handling it. So that's simple to fix. We just have to use a try catch. So now we've wrapped the, the bit that does the JSON parsing in a try catch. And if there's an error, we call the callback with an error. This still conflates the input with the output. It still won't work with control flow primitives. But it does handle errors in json.parse, so we've got a bit of a win there. We have a, a slightly subtler flaw, though. We're handling errors in the callback twice. So if, if the file system read is, succeeds, the JSON parse succeeds, we call the callback, but then that callback throws an error. We're going to call, call the callback again when really what we should do is just crash the application. So if you can, you can see this in action, if we were to do a read JSON with a callback which throws an error and increments some integer each time. So you can see here that n should be incremented once, but will actually get incremented twice. And this seems like a slightly obscure example, but this could manifest itself with additional log messages if you're logging the error or really weird behavior if you're actually doing something with these errors and handling them properly. So we can fix that. All we need to do is make sure that we're not calling the callback inside of the try catch. So this code makes sure that the only thing we do inside the try catch is parse the JSON. And then we actually call the callback outside of the try catch. Now, this fixes the bug. We're still conflating the input with output. We're still not working with control flow primitives, but we are at least handling errors. Now, this, was a, this, this code might seem like a weird bug. You might think I'd never write code like that. But a very popular library, Jade, has had this exact bug for several years, and it was only fixed about a month ago. So these, these bugs are happening in real code. I'm not making these up. And it's a fu so now we've got this fixed function. This, this function works. It's an implementation of read JSON, as I'd expect to see it in a typical Node.js program. But it's a far cry from that simple function we started with. This is the real semantics we want to express. We want to express these semantics and just the additional bit of information that the file system reads should be asynchronous. <laughs> 
So we need something simpler. We don't want to talk about error handling, because the error handling we're asking for should be the default anyway. So imagine for the moment that asynchronous methods still return values. Asynchronous functions are still going to return something. These values obviously won't be something we can use directly, because they're going to have to return this value synchronously, but they're going to execute asynchronously. So we don't know what that value represents yet, but we can somehow await it. We can somehow say, tell me when this value is, is settled. Tell me when we know what this value actually represents. So we have such a value in JavaScript. It's called a promise. There are a number of implementations of it. Q is extremely popular. I maintain my own promise library called promise, npm install promise if you're using Node. Um, so promise represents the result of an asynchronous operation. It can be in one of three states loosely. So it can be pending, or it can be fulfilled, or it can be rejected. So every promise starts out pending and then transitions into either fulfilled or rejected. And once it's transitioned into one of those states, it's immutable. It will never change back to being pending. It will never go from fulfilled to rejected or rejected to fulfilled. So we can implement read file in to, to return a promise based on the built-in Node.js fs.read file function. So we, we, we start by saying we're going to return a new promise, and we give the promise constructor a function that represents the asynchronous work we're going to do. And that function gets given a fulfill function and a reject function. And we use those inside the method to control the result of the promise. So we do the read file operation. And if the read file operation fails, we reject the resulting promise. And if the read file operation succeeds, we fulfill the resulting promise. So having built that, we can use the done method to await the result of a promise. So this is how we could build our read JSON function. So this read JSON function, again, returns a new promise with these fulfill and the reject parameters available. It does the read file. And when that's done, it tries to fulfill with, the JSON, with a JSON parsed result. And failing that, it rejects with the exception. And if the read file operation fails, it rejects with the exception. So done takes two arguments, the first of which is an unfulfilled callback, and the latter is an unrejected callback. So done there is our, is our method of waiting for the promise to fulfill. It doesn't conflate the input with the output anymore. We're now returning this value. So you can see the arguments for, for both the read file and the read JSON functions are back how they should be. They're just the input. The read file takes a file name and an encoding. And read JSON just takes a file name. We don't have that additional parameter. It's still not going to work with control flow primitives. That requires language support. It does still require a lot of extra work to handle errors. So we've still got that try catch in there, which is a bit pointless. It's nothing to do with our, error hand, our, our actual application business logic. So we really want to get that out. We have at least made a slight win, though, in that this double handling of the callbacks is, ha is dealt with for us. The promise. At libraries all promise not to, not to throw an exception when you call fulfill, which means we're not double handling any errors. We don't need to worry about that, at least. We can do better. When you started out, I bet many of you used for each when you, when you had one array and need another array that was based on that first array. And I bet most of you now use map in a lot of cases where you'd have used for each when you started out. So map lets you transform each of the items in an array and get a new array without having to manually construct that array yourself. We have a similar system in promises. So done just lets you extract the value of a promise. But we have a method called then, which lets you transform the promise into a new promise that's based on that first promise. So using that, we can rewrite our asynchronous read JSON function, just as read file, file name, encoding, then json.parse. So here what we're doing 
is the then method is creating a new promise based on the previous promise. So if the previous promise is rejected, then by default, this new promise, this child promise, gets rejected as well. So that propagation happens automatically. We don't need to handle that anymore. And the unfulfilled, if, the, if unfulfilled, so that the first method to pass to then is an unfulfilled handler, if that, if that method throws an error, then we reject the resulting promise. That happens automatically for us. So we don't need this try catch anymore. And if, the, if that method returns a value, then that's used as the result. That's what the promise is resolved with. So we don't need any messy callback stuff anymore. We're just dealing with the pure, simple business logic. Now, here we have a function that takes a single argument and passes that single argument to another function and returns the result. So we can simplify that a little bit by just passing json.parse directly. Note that I'm not calling json.parse there. I'm passing it as a function, as the argument. This doesn't conflate the input with the output. We're returning a promise from all of our functions. It still won't work with control flow primitives yet, but it handles errors, and it handles them really gracefully. We haven't added any extra code to handle those errors. They just bubble up the stack just like they would in synchronous code. So we can still do better, though. This is still, this is still a really simple example. It doesn't have any for loops in it. It doesn't have try catch. It doesn't have while. We want to be able to get back the ability to use those control, control flow structures to manage our code. So what if we could await a promise somehow? What if we could pause a function mid-execution and wait for the promise to resolve? Well, as, we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we have a method for pausing a function mid-execution, because that's what yield does. So with an async helper, we can make yield effectively wait for a promise to resolve and return the result. So at the top there, you can see our original synchronous JSON function. And at the bottom, you can see our asynchronous JSON function. And you can see all that changes is that we add the keyword, we add the async function, the async wrapper, the star, which denotes a generator function, and the yield to tell us that we're going to wait for that promise to resolve. This doesn't conflate the input with the output. This will work with control flow primitives. This handles errors. And it remains looking asynchronous. It has just enough clues in there that I can read this code and know instantly that it's going to be doing something asynchronous. We have the async keyword that tells us that function, the function as a whole is asynchronous. And we have the yield keyword telling us exactly where that asynchrony is going to happen. So we can use this to do things like a sequence of operations. We can read one file, then read another file, just by doing multiple yields. And then we can use the result. Because promises are first class values, we can fairly easily do the same thing in parallel, just by starting both operations and storing the promise that for each of those operations in turn. And then having started both operations, we then wait for them one at a time, which leads to the actual I.O. happening in parallel. And since the I.O. bit is the slow bit, that's really what we want. Like I said, it worked with control flow, it, with the, the normal control flow structures. So we can do this inside a try-catch. If we have some asynchronous get key method, we can put it inside a try-catch and have some handler in the catch block. We can use it inside for loops. Say we have an upload method to upload a document, and we want to upload multiple documents one at a time. We can just loop over the documents and upload them one at a time asynchronously. So the result of this is a, is a promise. So this function is a function that returns a promise. It's asynchronous in its own right, and it's using these asynchronous methods internally. If we wanted to do a parallel one, one option would be to start off all the operations in one at a time, and then wait for them all to complete one at a time. There are helper methods in most promise libraries that mean that there are easier ways you could do this. So I want to talk about how it works under the hood. Like Initially, that can look like a, a lot like magic. And I know my, my first reaction to this is, that seems like a lot of magic. <laughs> 
but it's actually relatively simple. So yield of some expression is itself an expression. Yield evaluates to something. And a generator can be manually operated using the next method. So you can take a generator, and rather than using a for of loop to, to loop through it, you can manually say, give me the next value, give me the next value, give me the next value. So say we have a simple generator here. This generator yields 10, asserts that the result of yielding 10 is 32, and then returns 42. We can execute this manually. First of all, we call demo, which instantiates the generator. This returns a, an iterator, a generator, and we can call next on it. And that moves the, point, the control flow pointer to that first yield expression. It returns us the thing that's been yielded, which in this case is the 10, and something that, and a, and a, and a done property that tells us that it's not finished yet. There are, there are potentially more values to yield. It's not the end of a function, and it's not a return keyword. We can then use d.next again to move, to carry on. But if we like, we can feed it a value to return from that yield. So by, fielding it, by feeding it that 32 there, we're able to inject that value into the function. And that becomes the value of res inside the function, hence the assert passes. The result we then get is 42, which is the result from the return. And the done property is true, because it's the last operation. If we call d.next again, it's going to throw, because that function is done. It's finished. So we can't carry on using it. Now, Generators were created with this use case in mind as one of the possible use cases. And as a result, we have this really helpful method of throw. Now, throw takes an error. It doesn't have to be an error. You can pass it like 10 if you want to. But I'd strongly recommend you use errors whenever you're throwing things. Throwing errors gives you stack traces. Throwing anything else doesn't. So we can use yield inside a try catch. And we can make that yield throw to invoke the, the catch operation. So again, we start by calling demo, instantiating the generator. We then call next to move it to that first yield. We get back the result that's yielded, so that's the 10, and the fact that it's not done. We can then call throw and throw an error into the generator. So that will cause the yield expression to effectively throw that error and cause the catch block to be executed. So that allows us, on the one hand, to represent fulfilling. So this is promises being fulfilled by injecting values into the yield. And we can represent promises being rejected by injecting in exceptions that are thrown into the yield. So we can put this all together, and we get this surprisingly simple function. So this is a function wrapper. It returns a function when given a function. First thing it does is call that function to return a generator. And that's going to be a generator that's effectively an, an, a lazy sequence of promises. So we start by moving to the first yield. We get the first promise that's yielded, and we attempt to handle it. So handling it says, if it's done, then it must be like a return keyword or the end of a function. So just return the result. Otherwise. We've been yielded a promise. We've been given a promise that the function wants us to resolve and give back the result of. So we call then on that promise. And if, it's, if that promise is fulfilled, we call generator.next with that result, which lets us inject the fulfilled result back into the function. And then we handle the next iteration, the next yield, the next yield keyword. If the promise is rejected, it's very much the same story, but with throw. So we're now injecting that exception, that throw, into the function as it's running and continuing where we left off. And if the function inside doesn't have a try catch, then that'll bubble out as an error. If it does have a try catch, though, it'll just get handled, and, and it can carry on, and they, it, might, it might have a try catch that then awaits other promises later on. So 
Generators are a big win. I don't think anyone, I, I haven't seen many people denying that. They're fantastically useful for controlling your asynchronous code. But there are people who dispute that, gener that promises are the right tool for the job for interacting with generators. So I want to give you some examples of some of the other things that people have done to try and manage their asynchronous code. I'm only going to give you examples that work with the native control flow structures, because I'm not really interested in anything that doesn't. But I haven't chosen difficult or bad examples. I just want to give you a feel for what else is out there and why I think they're not really sufficient. So Streamline has been around for a very long time. Streamline lets you replace all of your callbacks with the underscore character and then act as if all your functions are synchronous. Now, this is fantastically clever, but it does this by, re by compiling your, your code into some monstrosity that actually handles this. So that cross-compilation leads to really ugly code and really ugly behavior. And it has a few other issues. So it works with control flow primitives. Like I say, that's great. It handles error propagation properly. But it's conflating the input with the output again. Again, we've got this parameter that's not really a parameter. It's just about how we return the result. That's the underscore we have to pass everywhere. But that's not too much of an issue. It also looks entirely synchronous, though. When you read that as a JavaScript developer, it's natural to assume that the function there is synchronous. There's no keywords that imply that this is doing anything asynchronous. And that, to me, is a huge problem for maintainability. And it compiles to pretty ugly code. And like it or not, sooner or later, you're going to end up trying to debug that code. And that is not code you want to be debugging. So suspend. This is probably one of the most ingenious libraries I've seen in the last year. So this is a way of using pure callbacks, Node.js style callbacks, with generators. So it gives you a callback to use everywhere. That's this resume. You pass resume to any of your asynchronous operations that you want to yield on. You then yield, and it yields until resume is called. Now, this is very clever. It works with control flow primitives. It handles errors. It's conflating the input with output. But it has a really major flaw. It's really not doing what it looks like it's doing. So fs.readfile is still the Node.js style read file here. It returns undefined. So you're yielding undefined and waiting for that resume to be called. So if I put the fs.read file on the previous line and yielded some random value, say 10 or 42, it would have exactly the same behavior. The yield value is ignored. What that means is that when you refactor it, you get really surprising results. You can't do parallel operation, for example. You can't say, read this file and store the, the, the pending operation read this file, store that pending operation, and then yield on each one. Because then you've got a race to see which one calls resume first, because it's the ordering of calls to resume that determines which yield goes with which resume. So for me, that, that, that cleverness there is too much cleverness. It's not doing what it looks like it's doing. And therefore, I wouldn't want to use that. Next library, it's very popular. By, it's by Vision Media, TJ. Uh, it's called Co. So the idea here is your asynchronous operations also become lazy. They return a function that takes a callback. And then you yield that function that takes a callback as its only parameter. And Co will handle calling that function for you. This works with control flow primitives. It handles errors. It can't do parallel operation as easily because it's lazy. So you can't just start those operations and then yield on them because they won't actually start until you yield on them. You also can't share or cache the asynchronous operations. So I frequently cache promises uh, as part of like database reads and things. Caching these won't help because you'll end up still executing the function and you, another time for every time you ask for the value back. So it's a neat abstraction. It's one of the best of the, of the worst, but I still wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it. I'd still say promises are a lot more useful, a lot more powerful. Also, this offers you no help today. So using this method offers you no help when you don't have generators. It, it's only a help when you've got generators. So to wrap up, 
Promises, let us turn this read JSON function, which is 90% error handling, into a read JSON function that just has the business logic and that simple then me method to indicate that we're doing something asynchronous. Generators, let us turn this nested read file operation with, with multiple calls to then, which is about as simple as I can write that, that specific code in promises, into something that looks a lot more like what we're used to seeing. The multiple operations, one on each line, with no need, no need for indentation just to create that, that asynchronous control flow. I've been Forbes Lindsay. Thank you for listening. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub. I have a blog. I maintain loads of open source projects. I work at Redgate, and the slides are online if you want to grab them. Thank you.